really, this is creating a huge impetus to drive increased innovation to figure out how do we rebuild this in a safer way? How do we do it in a way that won't create the next user revolt in two or three years? And I think there's lots of uh, different ideas on how to do it, lots of different implementations if you're looking across the ad tech landscape. And I, th I think that's beautiful and wonderful to, to see. Hello everyone and welcome back to Identity Architects, the InfoSum podcast that spotlights the incredible leaders in the media industry shaping the future of data-driven advertising. I'm your host Ben Chiketti, and this week I had the opportunity to sit down with Mo Ismail, Executive Director of Product Management at Freewheel. Together Mo and I dive into the world of video advertising, explore the impact of third-party cookie deprecation, the wider identity landscape, and much, much more. Before we jump into that conversation, this is your reminder to hit that subscribe button so you'll always be the first to know when the latest episode of Identity Architects drops. And while you're there, why don't you drop us a five-star review? It really helps us to service this podcast to more and more people. But without any further delay, here's my chat with Mo. Mo, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Ben. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have this conversation. I feel like we've got a ton to cover. Uh, but for anyone who doesn't know you, can you give us a quick introduction to yourself uh, and to Free Will and what you do there? Sure. Hi, my name is Moai Smile, and I look after audience, identity, and measurement products across all platforms globally at Free Will. Awesome. So we're going to do what we always do, which is start with a series of quick fire questions just to get to know you a little bit better. And then we'll jump into some of the more detailed uh industry topics. So starting off with what is your earliest memory of advertising? My earliest memory of advertising is going to date me. So uh, no judging, please. I immediately think of the Air Jordan commercials of the late 80s, early 90s, and thinking to myself, if I get those sneakers, I can dunk. So I begged <laughs> my parents for months and months and months. I never got them and I never dunked. Nice. I mean, you can't see it, but literally to, to my side, I've got a collection of Jordan 1s that um, I have far too many Jordan 1s is probably the answer uh, to that question. So I love that. Great commercials. Uh, I feel like the 80s and 90s did it did it incredibly, incredibly well. Um, so before you landed in the world of media, what did you want to be when you were growing up? What did you want to be when you were younger? Was it an NBA basketball player, I guess, maybe? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> if, if only I got those sneakers. Uh, <laughs> my, my earliest memory of, of knowing what I want to be when I grow up is when I was visiting my extended family in Alexandria in Egypt. Um, and I remember just walking around, driving around, and being in awe of the richness and diversity of the architecture stretching all the way back to Macedonian era buildings that were still functional and in use through to Persian era, to Arab era, French, British, until today in the modern contemporary mm -hmm. era. And I remember uh, we were staying with one of my cousins who was studying architecture. I had an uncle who drove me around and showed me his architectural projects that were built with people living and uh, working in. And I knew that I was going to be an architect. And I just fell in love with the idea of how a spark of imagination and attention to detail can lead to a magical customer experience. Then I found out how much the average starting salary for an architect is, and I changed my major. <laughs> That's awesome. And, you know, switching gears from wanting to kind of be an architect and work in, in the architect industry to the media industry, the advertising industry, what was your first job in either advertising or marketing or the media industry as a whole? Right. My very first job was actually at Dun & Bradstreet. This was, this was a long time ago. It was the first non-business development salesperson to figure out how to build a new business unit within Dun & Bradstreet which is now known as Audience Solutions. And it was a wonderful and pivotal opportunity for me because I was given the chance to be introduced to AdTech and MarTech from a data provider's uh, point of view. Uh, I got to work with the brilliant folks from Unbound and had a chance to work with you know, Jerry Ronahan and Ilana Henlich. And I was able to build out the product engineering 
and data science functions to bring that wealth of DMB's B2B data in a really impactful way for our customers and partners. So you didn't go into a building architecture, but it sounds like you went into kind of product architecture and building solutions. So I feel like there was a full circle moment there, which is which is pretty cool. Yes, exactly. What do you think it was about the advertising industry that drew you in in the first place? And then what kind of keeps you in it to this day? What drew me in was uh, when I first joined Dun & Bradstreet and I joined the Innovation Lab, one of the products we were incubating there was is Dun & Bradstreet's data valuable in ad tech and more tech. So with some shoestrings and some duct tape, we put together a quick proof of concept, we went to market with it, uh, some customers bought it, and when they came back to buy some more, we knew we had something special. And once I had a taste of it, I was enthralled with it. And really, the main reason why I'm still in ad tech, given all of the other wonderful industries that are out there, which in many cases are going to be a lot simpler and easier to navigate, is because I really love the idea of helping publishers make more money so that they can make more premium content. And so advertisers can find more consumers effectively and efficiently. I love that. And I think, you know, Part of that process is kind of staying inspired by the industry that we're in um, and kind of helping customers the way that you said. So when you think about people who are just coming in to our industry and who are just starting out in their career in media and advertising, what advice would you give to someone who's just starting out in their career? Just two things, simplicity and empathy. Mm-hmm. Ad tech is really, really complicated and we kind of make it so ourselves, uh, the industry, but The advice I always give folks is once you get past that acronym, everything gets pretty straightforward and it's, it's still complex, but it doesn't need to be complicated. And the second thing that I always tell people is to keep yourself grounded in customer empathy, your customers. Yes. If you're, they could be advertisers, they could be publishers, they could be uh, all sorts of different people in the industry. But in the end of the day, the consumer, the viewer, the watcher, they are what builds the whole industry up. And so it's really, really important in this digital age to maintain those authentic human connections. Finally, uh, ad tech is, you know, at its core, technology applied to advertising. So to all my non-technical friends, I always tell them to go beyond the quote-unquote pipes and study the ORTB and understand the high-level architecture, uh, especially if you're not going into engineering. Yeah, I think those are incredibly important lessons. Um, And again, you know, I love how often on this podcast we bring things back to the consumer because they often feel like they're not part of the conversation, but they're a massive part of the equation in everything we do as an industry. So I think that's just incredibly important. And obviously you touched on how complex and complicated our industry can feel at times. So how would you describe what you do within the media and advertising industry to a 10 year old? I always think about this question to explain it to a five year old. I've got twin boys who are around that age right now. Uh, and they haven't asked me the question yet. I feel like I should ask them to ask me. Yeah. <laughs> and so I've been thinking about it for a really long time. Uh, I, I would say I've explained it to my wife several times, my mom several times, uh, and they just tell people I'm in computers, which is fun. So the way I would describe it, at least from the identity lens, is in real life, your identity is your name, where you live, maybe even your social security number. In ad tech, your identity is the collection of IDs for the devices that use like your phone, your tablet, your computer, and TV. I think that makes sense. I think it's good to kind of be able to communicate that clearly because I think it can feel like a very um, opaque thing, um, what we do, and especially the way that identity works. So I think it's incredibly important to kind of be able to communicate that clearly. Obviously, what we do takes uh, a ton of work. We always have to remain motivated, keeping the consumer in kind of front of mind, as you were saying a little bit earlier. How do you remain inspired? What inspires you on a daily basis? There's, There's so much amazing work happening in our industry right now. And I'm sure every year feels like it, but it always feels like a pivotal moment. And uh, I find it hard to find uh, many people that wouldn't say the same thing about 2024, who've already said that about 2023 and so on. 
What really inspires me deeply and to my core is really the amount of innovation, growth, and momentum and interest surrounding FAST. In particular, protecting the availability of free and supportive content will prevent us from returning to the Middle Ages, where folks with disposable income had access to information, education, and entertainment, while the rest of the society really didn't. I know that sounds dramatic, but we witnessed this happening over the past few years, where really old and storied news and entertainment publishers have been forced to move towards a subscription-based model. And in the process, cut off a large majority of the world's population from their premium content. So I'm really inspired by how we as an industry can make fast available to everybody equally. And it's really fantastic to be a part of that movement. Yeah, I bet. I mean, it's an incredibly interesting space. And it, as you say, it kind of seems to be developing on an almost daily basis at the moment. Uh, and I think it's an exciting area to focus on. Uh, we'll wrap things up from a quickfire uh, question perspective anyway, with my favorite question of the quickfire questions, which is if there was a song that was a soundtrack to your life, what would it be? I think if you ask me on a week by week basis, that might change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this week, it's Systematic by DJ Shadow featuring Nas. And really, the whole song is surrounded by a constant theme, which is change is everywhere. I'd love to sing the first few lyrics, uh, but I will spare the listeners from uh, <laughs> from that. Um, and and really, you know, I, I do listen to it every day right now, and uh, I make everybody around me listen to it, and because it really resonates with me in the sense that more than probably any other industry, ad tech reinvents itself every few years. A key example, top of mind for many of us, uh, is identity in ad tech, where for years we fed a system that relied on a fantastic amount of clandestine trading of users' identity. Leaving where we are today with essentially a revolt of users and governments to prevent the very practice that has fed that system. Uh, so here we are uh, with the need to reinvent ourselves and we will do so again and again. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's a great track. Um, and whilst you didn't uh, sing us a couple of bars, we will add it to our uh, Identity Architects playlist, which is available on Spotify. So everyone can go and listen to it after they finish listening to this podcast. So I think that's a, it's a great track. Awesome. So we'll move on to some of the more industry related questions. And you kind of touched on our first one, which is, you know, around the fact that we can all probably agree that the way the industry and data driven advertising has worked in the past has been flawed. So as we now look to rebuild the advertising industry, rebuild our ecosystem to be more customer centric, to be more privacy first, in your opinion, who's responsible for rebuilding that foundation? And how can it be done effectively? So it's a tough question. I think it's an industry wide challenge where all responsible. I can tell you that for Freewheel specifically, we see our role in the TV uh, ad ecosystem as that which is to find new and better ways of connecting buyers and sellers. Um, we're purpose built to help buyers and sellers find the simplest and most direct and efficient path to premium video ad inventory at scale. If you look at it from the grand scheme of things, the TV ad industry is very complex, very fragmented, and continually evolving. Just think about how you consume premium video 10 years ago, five years ago, and today. It looks extremely differently. Where you are is extremely differently. What devices you might have alongside of you is very different as well. And so, you know, just like the world we live in, it's, it's complex and it continues to get complex as the world around us becomes more connected and, and more complex. And so really the antidote to complexity is to introduce simplicity, introduce more straight lines instead of jagged lines, um, and make the TV ad buying and selling experience and process as streamlined and efficient as possible. But to answer your question directly, 
thinking about it from a TV advertising perspective, it's really simplifying everything that's possible uh, to reduce the complexity uh, as much as we can. Interoperability is key uh, to ensure that any solutions that we introduce work equally well for both buyers and sellers and don't advantage one side over the other. And collaboration um, to make sure that we're all doing our part, to make sure we have all the right relationships to facilitate um, all the above. Yeah, I think that makes total sense. And I think it's in- incredibly important and they're all incredibly important topics. And one of the things you've touched on there, which I think is really important, is we're seeing, you know, as a society, we're becoming increasingly digital first, which means that there is just a huge amount of data being created and collected, more data than ever before. So with that influx of data, what are some of the data-related challenges and opportunities that you see in the industry? So I I think there's a few. The first first challenge is scalability. And... Really, the challenge of scalability in TV advertising is very different from scalability in any other medium in the sense that TV is not just the big screen. TV now is consumed everywhere across any device. Every time you cross one of those thresholds, you're introducing a whole new slew of IDs that you need to contend with, that you need to understand, that you need to harmonize together. And really that ties back to my earlier point around interoperability. How can you get all of these IDs talking with each other, understanding each other, uh, all in a safe way, both from a consumer privacy lens and also from, from a commercial lens? It's also important to make sure that it's you know, really easy for your industry partners to to adapt to. And really, I think that means that we need to meet partners and customers where they are instead of insisting for them to meet us where we are. And it really gets to the fundamentals of behavioral change, which it's really hard. And if it doesn't work instantly, uh, if you don't have a good experience right away, you're unlikely to try it again. And so you only have so many shots at doing something of that magnitude and and that scale. So I think it's really important for us as an entire industry, again, to find that simplest path, to find that most efficient path, to eliminate as much of that friction as possible. And that's really at the core of uh, the concepts of where we're innovating at Freedom. You know, you mentioned free will and obviously identity has been a massive part of our conversation already and it's a massive part of our industry. Can you give some examples of what free will has done uh, in the identity space? Absolutely. So um, a little while ago, we announced the Free Will Identity Network. It's an initiative that we announced that can two years ago. And really the goal of, of that work, that product, is to really create that seamless interoperable bridge between buyers, sellers, and partners uh, to create kind of that smooth, frictionless experience for each of those players. I think, you know, this is especially important in the highly fragmented uh, TV advertising ecosystem. And essentially... This product is one that understands, yes, third-party IDs while they're still available and still work, uh, but is also introducing um, identity partners' IDs within that, within that same cohesive whole. And finally, also our customers' first-party IDs to create the most direct and immediate connections between buyers, sellers, and partners. With that product, the Free Will Identity Network, we're, we're fueling that interoperability in partnership with folks like Blockgraph, Experian, Libram, TransUnion, and more. And, you know, the, I think, you know, the simplest way to describe it, it's sort of like a, a clean room that runs in real time in the activation platform, allowing the owners of identity, those that have the, the direct uh, relationships with consumers to be in full control of their own identity assets to choose 
who they want to share it with um, and uh, know that there will be no chance for data leakage and no chance for uh, any derivative data products being created from that. Yes, you touched on third-party identifiers there, and obviously third-party identifiers, including the now infamous third-party cookie, um, are going away uh, slowly but surely. What advice would you offer to our listeners of this podcast who are preparing and navigating that change right now? It's it's certainly been top of mind for for many of our customers and many of our partners. So uh, first thing I would say is, hey, everybody, change is constant. Like we kind of knew that this was happening for a long time uh, by ad tech standards. The first inklings that we got about this was back in 2017 when Apple implemented uh, ITP. So really we've been operating in a semi third-party cookie and third-party device ID environment for quite some time now. So we kind of know what it looks like and really what we're talking about is the last bastion of third-party cookies and device IDs finally going away as well. Um, but I think it's really important to add that it's not just the third-party cookie. I mentioned mobile IDs, but we're seeing the same thing happening with CTV IDs, ones that used to be considered as part of that overall grouping of third-party IDs are either already gone or on their way out from that third-party context. In addition, you know, IP addresses are also at risk. Not that they're going away, but when you have an IP address that belongs to a household for an expected and lengthy period of time, you can use it for a lot of these attack use cases. However, if it changes randomly, uh, but more importantly, when tens of thousands of households have the same IP address, you probably shouldn't be using it uh, in the same way anymore. Um, so, you know, think about uh, what this change means to their particular business. And I think it really comes down for both buyers and sellers to uh, use this as an opportunity to deepen and strengthen your relationships with consumers to deepen and strengthen your relationships across folks who are operating on the other side of the landscape. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think there's like a reframing that can happen, right? Which is obviously it can often be seen as this massive negative and this massive challenge um, with the deprecation of third-party identifiers. But actually, if you reframe it to be an opportunity uh, that we've touched on multiple times now to kind of rebuild a better foundation to build better uh, relationships with consumers and with our partners. Uh, I think it can be a more positive thing. And I guess on the more positive side of things, when you're looking at the industry landscape today, what are some of the things that excite you about the industry and where we're headed right now? There's so many things. Um, one, one of the really exciting things that I've been noticing in my day to day is um, just a sheer amount of people who are starting to care a lot more about data broadly and identity more particularly. I think identity has, generally speaking, uh, 10 years ago, wasn't the biggest deal. It was taken for granted. Five years later, it was a big deal, but most people didn't understand it. Now, it's really hard to find folks who are not really well conversant in it. So I think the more people who are aware and understand the implications and the usage of it, I think it's, it's good for us overall as, as an industry. Uh, the other thing is, you know, finding more and more folks who are uh, engaging with each other, looking for ways to create interoperability. And so, you know, if I think about our partners and how we work together and created this solution uh, that works across free world platforms, you know, they didn't have to, but they saw the opportunity and they saw uh, what we're looking to accomplish from an interoperability perspective and, and they were all in. And so I'm really excited about that too. And finally, and to your point, Ben, really, this is creating a huge impetus to drive increased innovation to figure out how do we rebuild this in a safer way? How do we do it in a way 
that won't create the next user revolt in two or three years. And I think there's lots of uh, different ideas on how to do it, lots of different implementations if you're looking across the ad tech landscape. And I, th- I think that's beautiful and wonderful to, to see. Yeah, I agree. I think the more we can view it as an opportunity, the better, right? And it's that kind of reframing um, exercise that we can all do. You know, inertia can be an incredibly powerful thing and people have been willing to kind of push third-party cookies and third-party identifiers for as long as they possibly could and not make a massive change until they're somewhat forced to. So I think the more that we can kind of reframe it and focus on the positives and focus on the innovation, which I think is such an important thing that you pointed out, you know, with any challenge, with any change comes innovation and opportunity. So I think that's that's super important. Let's for a moment uh, imagine you had a magic wand and we could put politics aside and we could assume that all the content players were willing to play nicely. How would you like to see data better used in the advertising value chain? And then a second part to that question, what's the challenge that's stopping it from happening? Um, ben, you stole my question. It's like my favorite question when I'm doing customer discovery, the magic wand question. Uh, I've never had anybody use it on me before, but here we go. I'll taste of my own medicine. Uh, um, so, wow, this is really hard being on the receiving end of that. Uh, <laughs> so, if everybody played nicely together, I think we need to go back and anchor ourselves in the viewer and the consumer experience and think about how we can use our data, uh, their collective data, uh, in a safe way, in a privacy centric way in a way that they're in control. And that's clear in terms of how it can and how it cannot be used. And to forcibly uh, enforce and honor their choice. I think, you know, with all of those constructs in place, we can start to have a conversation on how we can use that data to drive, inform, optimize, and measure ad buying and selling experience, which will generate more fresh content for the same viewers to enjoy, that will generate more more engaged and satisfied consumer. uh, And it's a win, win, win for everybody involved. Yeah, obviously, we talk about video and we talk about TV. And, you know, if you're a consumer, you largely just see it as one of those two things. You don't necessarily know whether it's CTV or AVOD or whatever other acronym we might want to wrap around it, right? But one of those areas of focus is traditional broadcasters and what we're seeing is them having a big challenge around attracting eyeballs what would you recommend broadcasters do to protect themselves as innovation comes through i really think that the primary challenge of traditional broadcasters is less about eyeballs and more about the rapid changes in distribution uh, not too long ago, they had a single distribution channel, linear TV. Today, they have at least a dozen. Uh, if you're thinking about all the apps and device types where their content is distributed and consumed, I think it's really incredible how traditional broadcasters have been able to adapt their business to cater to consumers evolving habits, to evolving technology and bandwidth capabilities. Uh, And it's still evolving today. Uh, And I think as a result, consumers in the US at least actually watch more premium TV. If you count all of their consumption across all the devices and not less. Uh, And I think we'll continue to see that trend over the next few years. And so, in my opinion, large traditional broadcasters' primary challenge is how do they treat that disparate and seemingly fragmented audience across all of these endpoints, uh, across all of these devices, across all of these apps, across all of these distribution partners as one single whole, as one single entity, instead of dozens of siloed components. And I think that's a technology and an identity challenge at its core. How do you turn that into a cohesive audience addressable and measurable pool of supply? It's almost, you know, 
meeting consumers where they are as well and not trying to kind of battle against consumer habits and how they're choosing to consume content and taking advantage of the fact that people are consuming, as you say, to your point, people are actually consuming more content than ever before. They're just consuming it in a different way. And therefore it's us adjusting to that to ensure we're kind of providing a, as content consumers, we're, we're providing a seamless experience, but then we're able to make that work from an advertising and an ad tech perspective. And obviously, you know, we touch on video advertising and, you know, given Freewheel's position at the center of video advertising, where do you see data and data collaboration in the next two to five years? I think in TV, having grown up in digital display ads and text-based ads, I think TV is um, still catching up to the other side of the ecosystem. I think, you know, that's kind of my superpower right now. Like I can look into my crystal ball of what happened in display advertising with data five years ago. And that's probably what's going to happen next year in TV. Mm. Don't tell me about it. I think a, a critical key ingredient through, throughout the TV ad buying process from pitch to pay is, is data, is identity. Without that, it's really hard, if not impossible, to forecast, to target, to frequency manage, to optimize, and of course, to measure. Uh, so it's going to be something that permeates and guides and influences decisions and how TV ads are bought and sold and, and valued. And I think, you know, it needs to be and is already becoming something that's more deliberate and of course, more transparent to consumers. Yeah. And, you know, transparency is key. And I think that's a really positive forward looking way for us to kind of uh, wrap things up. But before we finish entirely, you know, this podcast is all about spotlighting people like yourself, the individuals who are pioneering the new way to use data to deliver better customer experiences across the media industry. So when you look at people you admire in the industry, people within your network, who would you nominate for us to interview in an upcoming episode? There's so many brilliant minds working on this incredibly interesting challenge uh, and opportunity in front of us right now. And I have uh, the privilege of meeting and working with too many people that, you know, I would, I would nominate. There's, there's a couple of folks that really stand out as folks that I think would be really interesting to hear from. There's a gentleman named Eddie Lee of NBCU who's doing some really, really incredible things with first party identity from a traditional broadcaster's lens. I think he's brilliant and I think you, you would really enjoy the conversation with him. There is Akash of Merkel who's doing equally impressive things with, with identity. And, you know, he's incredibly interesting and uh, absolutely brilliant. And there's Mark Jablowinski of Optimal, who has really pioneered this in a completely different industry within ad tech. And uh, he's really inspiring to me. And, you know, I jump at every opportunity to chat with him because I learn something new from him every single time. I haven't given any of them a heads up, so heads up, guys. <laughs> I love that. Those are three awesome, awesome recommendations. And we'll definitely be reaching out to them to try and get them on the podcast. So, so I appreciate that. Mo, thank you so much for being on Identity Architects. Uh, thank you so much for providing us with incredible insight and intelligence into the industry as a whole, what Free Will's doing and where we're going as a future. So I really appreciate your time today. Likewise, this was fun. Thanks again to Mo for joining us. You know, this podcast is called Identity Architects, so I loved hearing about Mo's early ambitions to be an architect and how he's now ended up being an architect for solutions in our industry. All that leaves for me to do is to remind you to hit that subscribe button so you know when the next episode of Identity Architects lands. But until then, thanks for listening.